ay divina, divine. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, po. Good morning. I was just asking, uh, sorry, recording, recording na pala, Rian. Ah, yes, po. <laughs> Okay, so good morning to our audience joining us in the eastern portion of the hemisphere and good evening to our audience joining us in the western portion of the hemisphere. Again, welcome to another series of the La Salle Sustainability Lecture. Uh, this is organized by the La Salle University in cooperation with the International Association of La Salle Universities. Uh, just some reminders before we start our lecture. Uh, may we request our audience to mute your Zoom. Uh, and later on, after the lecture, uh, we would request you to type in your questions in the chat box or uh, unmute during the question and answer <laughs> portion. Uh, to start off, uh, uh, let's start with uh, our opening prayer. <laughs> Again, good morning and good evening, everyone. Again, I'm uh, Dr. Ari Sobando. I'm the Assistant Dean for Research and Advanced Studies at the Gokong Way College of Engineering, De La Salle University. And together with me, uh, this is uh, co-hosted by Ms. Ria Somaga. Uh, good and good morning. 
Uh, and uh, before we even start our lecture today, uh, uh, we would have an introduction of the sustainability lecture series, which would be delivered by, by the Vice President for Research and Innovation of De La Salle University, Professor Raymond Tan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this edition of the 2023 Sustainability Lecture Series. I am Professor Raymond Tan. I'm the Vice President for Research and Innovation of De La Salle University in Manila, Philippines. This lecture series is being held in cooperation with the International Association of La Salle Universities, or IALU. This is a global network of universities with presence in the Americas, in Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. The lecture series is conducted by the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research at De La Salle University, which is a comprehensive private nonprofit Catholic university in the Philippines. As uh, the flagship Lasallian institution in this country, we are proud to say that we've grown significantly, not just as an educational institution, but as an institution that drives the creation of new knowledge through research and development. The lecture series is inspired by, firstly, Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. This document enjoined Christians all over the world to reassess their lifestyles and adopt more sustainable practices for the benefit of the human race. Similarly, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals set forth in 2015 17 goals that have been adapted by countries all over the world as a roadmap for development within the limits that can be sustained by the planet. Both of these documents provide basis and inspiration for the sustainability initiatives that are undertaken by academics throughout the world, including academics working within the IALU network. The sustainability lecture series was initially conceived in late 2020 by a core group consisting of Dr. Kathleen Aviso, the Dean of the Gokong Wei College of Engineering, Dr. Carmelita Kebenko, Chancellor Emeritus of De La Salle University, and Dr. Alvin Colaba, the Director of the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research, and of course, yours truly. The lecture series deals with diverse topics in sustainable development and are mostly held on the last Wednesday of each month, streamed via Zoom and with recordings made available via YouTube. We have a dedicated YouTube channel with um, all, almost all of the previous lectures made available publicly with a total of about 5,000 plus individual views to date. And we've drawn on resourced persons from the global IALU network to share their initiatives on sustainable development. And as the world emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic, we have decided that this lecture series remains a testament to the Lasallian commitment to a greener planet. Thank you and good morning. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much, Professor Tan, uh, for the introduction of the La Salle Sustainability Lecture Series. Uh, today, our lecture is entitled Social Ecological Network Modeling of Agri-Systems, Prospects for Enhanced Decision-Making Towards Sustainable Best Management. Uh, this webinar uh, it talks about uh, the process graph or P graph which is a modeling framework used in engineering, has been used in analyzing social ecolo ecological networks whose components may not necessar necessarily be linked simply by a trophic relationship. 
more recently, PGRAPH framework was used to model an agro-system affected by an infestation of an invasive and highly destructive insect pest. In that study, the effects of biological and chemical control were analyzed with results suggesting the importance of biological control in the management of pest outbreak and in the eventual recovery of productivity. In view of those findings, which were consistent with real world observations in laboratory and field-based studies, the proponents present the P-graph modeling as a novel theoretical approach that can assist in formulating better informed decisions for practical and sustainable pest management. Now to introduce the speaker and also introduce Sesdar, may I call on Professor Alvin B. Kulaba. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Obando. Good morning, uh, Dr. Raymond Tan. Uh, uh, I think uh, Dean uh, Kathleen Aviso. Uh, this is uh, again, uh, you know, another interesting uh, talk uh, in our sustainability lecture uh, series. This is uh, organized by the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research at De La Salle University, uh, which was established uh, 20 years ago. So established in 2013. And over the years, we have conducted studies related to sustainability uh, with now over 2,000 focus publications with an aggregate index of around uh, 67. This is a collective work of our top Filipino Lasallian scientists. Today, as uh, already uh, mentioned by Dr. Ubando, we have uh, you know, a distinguished uh, speaker. Uh, he is an entomologist of the Biological Control Research Unit and an associate professor at the Department of Biology at the La Salle University, Manila, Philippines. Our speaker obtained his MS and PhD in biology degrees from DLSU in, in 2009 and 2016, respectively. His, his previous and current research projects focus on integrated pest management, particularly biological control using paras parasitoids and predators against agricultural and urban insect pests. He was among the DLSU entomologists who discovered, reported the first record of, and taxonomically described a native species of parasitic wasp, Comperiella, Calawanica, Barion, Almarines, and Amalin, that has been recognized as the biological control agent against the Coco Lisa, Aspigiotus. Rigidus reine, a major pest of coconut in the Philippines. Dr. Almarines is also a licensed professional teacher, having obtained his Bachelor of Science in Biology for Teachers degree from the, uh, from the Philippine Normal University, and is a professional uh, teaching and as a professional teaching license, which he obtained in 2006. He has taught in several other universities at the Philippine Normal University and at the Technological University of the Philippines in Manila, and is a member of several professional organizations and has given multiple seminars and training in biology for uh, kindergarten to 12 STEM teachers to speak on sociological, ecological network modeling of agroecosystems prospects for enhanced decision-making towards sustainable pest management. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome and give a round of applause, virtual applause to Associate Professor Dr. Billy Joel M. Almarines. Joel. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Professor Kulaba. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is feeling fine right now. Uh, to be honest, I still have a bit of quote unquote jet lag coming from you know Czech Republic. You know, uh, 
my co-faculty from De La Salle University have also been to the Czech Republic. I know what uh, I know. You get what I mean. <laughs> We've been checking requirements from there. Anyway, uh, for today, uh, I would like to set aside uh, uh, term end uh, matters and uh, share to everyone this uh, talk, which I entitled "Social Ecological Network Modeling of Agroecosystems," and this talk aims to present some prospects for enhanced decision-making towards sustainable pest management. Now, uh, this talk will uh, include, but will not be limited to uh, an introduction to integrated pest management and biological control for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the concepts. And uh, I will tell a story. You know? uh, when I give talks, I like to tell stories. I hope you don't mind. Uh, I would like to share the case of the Cocolisap outbreak in southern Tagalog, Luzon Island in the Philippines, and uh, uh, provide a brief overview of uh, the PGRAPH approach and socio-ecological network modeling. And then I will share to everyone an application of the socio-ecological network modeling uh, to an agroecosystem, specifically uh, the coconut agroecosystem, and then I will share some take-home points. Uh, now, integrated pest management is a set of uh, strategies that are uh, employed to manage the population of a pest. Now, when we say pest, uh, it's any species that we do not want around. Okay, and. Uh, Although we have this notion that pests, especially in agriculture, have to be eradicated, but uh, good pest management, uh, in order for it to be ecologically sound, uh, the pest management strategy or set of strategies will only have to manage the population of the pest down to levels wherein the pest will no longer be able to uh, render economic damage. Now. Uh, I suppose this uh, slide uh, has always been shared in all of my talks, but uh, just to, uh, to, to, to share to everyone how biological control, uh, if we take a look at the, uh, this is a version of the, what we call the ITM pyramid. Okay? Uh, the biological control is at the base, meaning it has to be prioritized over other uh, control strategies. In particular, the application of chemical pesticides. And as we go up the IPM pyramid, the costs increase, the environmental impacts as well, especially negative impacts, the environment also increase. And there would also be a consequent decrease in sustainability as well as in species diversity. Okay, So we can say that biological control uh, and other strategies that are found at the bottom of the pyramid would be those that are considered to be more sustainable and more environmentally friendly. Okay. Now, in the Philippines, it's a sad reality. Uh, I'm just being honest here. It's a, it's a sad reality that uh, almost always, not just in agriculture, but also in households, whenever there are pests, especially insect pests, we resort to chemical control. Uh, without uh, consideration of the possible consequences to not just uh, the pest that we are trying to eradicate, but also other non-targets. Okay. So biological control, by the way, it's the use. So it's a strategy that uses or depends on natural enemies to manage the population of the pest. Okay, so uh, when we say natural enemy, it can be a predator, it can be a parasite, it can be a parasitoid, it can even be a disease-causing organism. So basically, we are using the biology and ecology of the pest species against it. Again, the aim is not to completely eradicate the pest, but we want to manage the population of the pest so that it can no longer render any damage, uh, significant damage. Okay? And biological control has been seen as a viable strategy in managing invasive pest populations. Okay? Now, uh, the case of uh, the Cocolisap 
outbreak in southern Tagalog, uh, the southern Tagalog region of Luzon Island in the Philippines. This was uh, when I got into not just entomology, but also integrated pest management. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the presence of my dear mentor, uh, Dr. Divina Amalin. Uh, she's in this uh, in this webinar. Okay. Uh, so if we can see the picture that I'm showing right now, the coconut palms, uh, the coconut trees there, uh, they have uh, severe chlorosis of uh, the lower half of the crown. Okay, when we say chlorosis, leaves are supposed to be green in color, right? But uh, when you see yellowing or browning of the leaves, then there's something wrong. Okay, in the case of uh, the, the stand of coconut trees that we see in this photo, okay, uh, there's something really terribly wrong. And uh, the problem was caused by this, okay, the coccolisap. The coccolisap is an insect where in the damaging stage of the insect does not resemble the typical insect uh, form that we are used to. Now, we are, we are very familiar with insects as having a head, thorax, abdomen. Uh, many of them have wings and then there are three pairs of legs. As you can see what are on this photo, these are the damaging stages of uh, the coccolisap, the coconut scale insect. Okay, and they look more like what? Sunny side up eggs, right? Now, uh, control was attempted okay, uh, by government agencies and other institutions to, uh, to, to manage the population. Uh, and even I think they attempted to eradicate uh, Aspidiotus rigidus. And primarily, the control strategy hinged on chemical control by injecting a neonicotinoid insecticide, dinotefuran, into the trunks of the coconut trees. Okay? So what they did was they drilled holes into the trunk of the coconut trees and then through that hole, uh, the, the chemical agent, dinotefuran, was injected. Okay? So the idea was that the chemical agent through uh, water transport in the plant would go up the crown, okay, because it's the it's the fronds that uh, the pest would typically uh, infest, okay. But uh, infestation may also be found on the nuts, okay. But it's mostly on the foliage, so uh, that's the idea that uh, instead of spraying, which well, I think the trunk injection in a way uh, minimizes uh, unwanted effects, especially to non-targets. However, neonicotinoids like dinotefiran, they have been reported to be very highly toxic to non-target species, especially bees, okay, honeybees. Okay? Uh, so as an emergency response, that's how uh, the government agencies went about it. Okay? Biological control was also attempted by releasing, rearing, mass rearing, and releasing natural enemies of a scale insect, not as pediotus rigidus, ano, but uh, a scale insect that's very closely related to Aspidiotus rigidus, which was uh, earlier reported to be found in the Philippines, Aspidiotus destructor. However, in uh, insect ecology okay, and in ecology in general, there could be specificity between a species and its natural enemy complex, meaning not the... It, it does not necessarily mean that a particular species is closely related to another species, that the natural enemy complex, meaning the natural enemies of the other species, will work against the species of interest. Okay? And that's actually what happened between 2010 and 2015. Okay? So biological control or attempts at biological control using natural enemies of of, of Aspidiotus destructor did not really work against Aspidiotus rigidus. Now, our research group, uh, headed by uh, Professor Amalin, okay, we actually discovered, uh, I think it was mentioned in uh, that kind introduction, uh, we discovered a parasitic wasp that we found to attack by laying eggs or laying at least one egg into the pest, 
Okay? So the egg is inserted into the pest. The egg hatches, the egg of the parasitic wasp hatches, and the larva that's now inside the pest would have to feed, right, in order for it to grow and develop. So it will feed on the innards of the pest, effectively killing the pest. Okay? So parasitized coccolisap would look like this. Okay? Uh, when, uh, when the parasitic wasp Comperiella calawanica is uh, close to emergence, uh, one will notice an elongated dark spot in the middle of the coccolisap. Okay? Now, uh, we observed recovery of uh, coconut trees in southern Tagalog uh, that we believe and claim were aided by natural biological control because these were trees that were not injected with dinotefuran. However, they were able to recover. And these trees that we, from which we con collected our samples from 2014 to 2016, uh, we were able to uh, record very high parasitization rates of the scale insect by Comperiella calawanica. This representative uh, location here in Carlan Laguna, we were able to record parasitization rates of 82.4% to 91.3%. So what that means is that out of 100 scale insects in the colony, out of 100, around 80 to 90 will die by parasitization by Comperiella calawanica. So it's not going to be 100%. There's no eradication that will take place. But the remaining 10%, I su su suppose uh, there's, there, there's the remaining 10%. The, the remaining 10% of the pest population will not be able to render any significant economic harm. Okay. However, they, uh, there were also claims back then that uh, it was uh, the typhoon that uh, struck that part of Luzon sometime in 2014 uh, that brought down the infestation, okay? Or at least uh, helped significantly in bringing down the outbreak in Southern Tagalog. So now that gives us, that, that brings us uh, that that poses some questions. What really affected control over the outbreak in Southern Tagalog? Was it biological control? Was it chemical control? Or was it a typhoon? So now, when another case of, say, an outbreak of the same pest species happens somewhere else in the Philippines, or maybe somewhere else, say, in Southeast Asia, how then would we approach the problem? Are we going to use chemical control? Are we going to use biological control or maybe a combination of the two? What control strategies, specific control strategies do we apply? What biological control agents do we need to release? Right? Or maybe we just like pray to God, pray to our creator and wait for a typhoon to pass and manage the pest problem for us. So how then do we decide? Okay, now... I am going to share a few of my personal uh, remarks right here at this point. Uh, it, it's a reality that especially in emergency situations, pest control tends to follow a trial and error approach, especially uh, given the lack or scarcity of baseline data. Right? So uh, the efficacy of control strategies, the timing of control application, and what the consequences of the control strategy employed would be. It's sort of a trial and error endeavor, right? And another point that I would like to uh, raise at this point is that agroecosystems, agricultural systems basically are enge engineered ecosystems, right? Uh, agroecosystems are uh, developed, they are modified, right? not just the components of the ecosystem, but also the processes that would be taking place. So basically, an agroecosystem is an engineered ecosystem. And with that in mind, okay, we thought of applying an engineering uh, tool or approach to uh, modeling 
uh, agro ecosystems for integrated pest management. So one such approach would be the PGRAF approach. And I believe that uh, more of you are much better versed at PGRAF than myself. Okay, So the PGRAF or the process graph, it's a theoretic framework that was developed by Fiedler, Fan, and their co-workers. And uh, it is computer-aided so that there's automated generation of network structures. Okay, And the beauty of PGRAPH models is that uh, PGRAPH uh, can be used to assemble fragmented information so that uh, the image or the picture is more coherent. Okay, And we can enumerate networks, viable networks or systems using algorithms within the PGRAPH framework. Okay? And also, we can identify limiting states within the network. And in uh, the context of socio-ecological network modeling, the flexibility in terms of diet of some of the biotic components of the network can be modeled as well. Okay? And uh, I would like to cite uh, specifically at this point the study by Lao Cabezas et al., okay, uh, which was published in 2020, I think. Okay, uh, so this was the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first attempt, the very first attempt at using PGRAPH for socio ecological network modeling. Okay. So, uh, socio-ecological networks are basically models of ecosystems that are linked to human populations. Okay, that's where the social part uh, comes in. Okay, because we, okay, humans, okay, human society derives products and services from ecosystems. The ecosystems may be natural ecosystems. They, they may be uh, manipulated ecosystems. Now, an agricultural system or an agro-ecosystem is a manipulated ecosystem, right? So hence, it, one would think that PGRAF, the PGRAF approach can be used for agro-ecosystems, right? So uh, in the use of PGRAF, the PGRAF approach for, uh, for uh, network modeling, uh, uh, building blocks of uh, the ecosystem can be defined okay, as so, as shown in this slide, uh, these figures coming from Lao et al. Okay? And then the, the, the application, PGRAPH Studio, will uh, assemble the ecosystem network okay? and also uh, feasible networks using PGRAPH algorithms. Okay, so uh, components, especially biotic components, okay, uh, in an ecosystem, in the network, okay, the viability, okay, and the criticality can actually be analyzed using the PGRAPH approach. Okay, so now uh, we attempted, okay, and we were successful actually in using the PGRAPH approach for social ecological network modeling okay, of an agro-ecosystem, specifically the coconut agro-ecosystem. So this one, uh, our recent publication in Biocontrol. So uh, this was co-authored by Professor Amalin, uh, Professor Aviso, Professor Cabezas, Professor Lau, and Professor Tan. Okay, in... Uh, this study, we used uh, the PGRAPH to come up with the model of uh, the scale-infested coconut agro-ecosystem. Okay, so we used the PGRAPH studio to assemble the networks, the model. Okay, and here are the network materials and units that we defined. Okay, so those that pertain to uh, the coconut as a plant. Okay. Uh, those that pertain to a pollinator, okay, uh, the honeybee, apis, genus apis, and then the natural enemy of Cocolisap, Comperiella calawanica, and then of course the pest, Aspidiotus rigidus, or the Cocolisap. Okay, uh, so the network components, 
which are presented here are those that pertain to coconut production. So there's uh, one for coconut tree production, for pollination, because coconuts will not form if the flowers are not pollinated. And one uh, biotic factor that is very important in coconut pollination is the honeybee. Okay? Hence, we also have a network component here that pertains to uh, the honeybee, apis. And uh, then there are also components that pertain to pest infestation and management, namely uh, that for Aspidiotus rigidus, in particular the reproduction of Aspidiotus rigidus as it feeds on the foliage of the coconut palm. Okay? And then the infestation that it renders on uh, the coconut palm and then, of course, Comperiella calawanica or the parasitic wasp, the natural enemy. Okay? And we also included in the network chemical pest control because that was what was done, uh, what had been done in uh, southern Tagalog, in the southern Tagalog outbreak. Right? So now, in PGRAF, we can, uh, we can indicate flow rates. Okay? And the flow rates that we used were based on published and unpublished values excuse me, and some of our expert estimates. Okay, and we express the values from zero to one and we set, uh, we set the, the, the measurement uh, type or, cap or quantity type to capacity across all components, across all flows for uniformity. Okay, so here are some of the assumptions of uh, the model, okay? Uh, you, may, you might be wondering, why weren't there uh, components pertaining, say, to soil, uh, soil factors, nutrients? How about water? How about sunlight? Right? How about precipitation? So it was among the assumptions of our model that the selected factors that were defined as network components are those that most likely would have a direct influence on coconut productivity in the scenario where there's an infestation and the infestation has to be managed. Sunlight, temperature, gases, water, nutrients are assumed to remain constant or if there are perturbations, the perturbations are very minimal. Okay, so here would be the model. Okay, so using the PGRAF approach, we were able to come up with this network model. And uh, for those of you who are not uh, engineers, okay, uh, we have here the simplified representation of the network. Okay, so uh, I would like to I would like us to focus on this one uh, for a more convenient view of the model. So we have here, okay, of course, the coconut trees that would bear flowers. And when the flowers are pollinated by honeybees, okay, they turn into coconuts, okay, which humans consume, right? So the coconut trees would have to reproduce, all right? And uh, the foliage of coconut trees are those that get infested by Aspidiotus rigidus, the pest. So Aspidiotus rigidus, okay, uh, without getting into much detail about their biology. So the immature forms of Aspidiotus rigidus are the ones that get dispersed. They get spread around via wind. So when those immature forms, which we call crawlers, get into uh, get onto the foliage or the leaflets of the fronts of coconut trees, they establish themselves there and they feed there. They stay there and form colonies, okay? thereby causing the infestation. All right? Now, Comperiella calawanica, the parasitic wasp that we discovered in 2014, and we have found it to be an effective natural enemy of uh, Aspidiotus rigidus. It, as I've described earlier, attacks Aspidiotus rigidus. Okay? So it does so for it to be able to reproduce. Okay? And in the outbreak in southern Tagalog, okay, Dinotefiran was used as the chemical insecticide. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, they, it was trunk injected into the coconut trees. However, there have been reports okay, uh, that 
dinotefiran and other neonicotinoids are very highly toxic, not just to honeybees, but also to other hymenopteran species. When we say hymenopterans, these are the wasps, the ants, the, the bees, okay, and their relatives. Okay, and uh, from uh, from our set of unpublished data, we have also done toxicology experiments, okay, uh, on dinotefiran, on Comperiella calawanica. And uh, it's just a matter of minutes that dinotefiran is able, even the lowest recommended dosage of dinotefiran, as indicated on the packaging, okay, and much lower than that, concentrations much lower than that. It's able to, they are able to render 100% mortality on Comperiella calawanica in just a matter of minutes. Okay? So, uh, apis, the honeybee, the pollinator, and Comperiella calawanica are susceptible to toxicity that can be rendered by the chemical agent. So, this is the maximal structure, okay, uh, using the accelerated branch and bound algorithm or ABB algorithm. Okay? So uh, one, the first feasible structure that was generated by the ABB would have all of the components, okay? And from this, we can see that there's maximal overall health of Aspidiotus rigidus, Comperiella calawanica, and the pollinator, the honeybee, as well as coconut. But there is minimal input of dinotefuran. There's minimal input of the uh, chemical insecticide. Okay, but uh, there is still maximal control of Aspidiotus rigidus. If we go back to this one, okay, the level of its infestation is down to just 5%. Okay, so where would control come from? Okay, we can only surmise that the control would come from the natural enemy. So that's biological control. So this one is a predominantly biologically controlled infestation scenario, which leads to the recovery of nut productivity, okay? There is maximal yield of consumable nuts. This one shows the second feasible structure, okay? Note here that there is no insecticide in the system, okay? There's maximal overall health, both of the pest and the pollinator, okay? As well as of the coconut. So now you might think, wait, there's maximal overall health of Aspidiotus rigidus, the pest, but why would there be maximal overall health of the coconut? And there's also maximal yield of consumable nuts. Note that present in the system is Comperiella calawanica, which shows in this scenario maximal, maximum rather 100% overall health of Comperiella calawanica. So this is a model that represents a scenario of exclusively biologically controlled infestation. Again, the infestation is present, but the biological control agent, Comperella calawanica, is able to effectively manage the population so that there's maximal yield of consumable nuts. Uh, now, the third feasible structure, as we can see here, okay, there's maximal overall health, Fasmidiotus rigidus, and there's also maximum overall health of uh, the honeybee as well as the natural enemy, the biological control agent, Comperella calawanica. Again, the pesticide is absent. There's no chemical insecticide input. Okay? There is total control of Aspidiotus rigidus population. As you can see, if we go back to this one, okay, there is no infestation level here, which would represent a scenario that's not impossible, but it's not really that uh, likely in the field. There's zero infestation rendered by biological control. But again, this one, this scenario is not, uh, not as likely as the earlier scenario, wherein there's still some, there are still some, uh, so, some colonies of the pest, as we go to Sirigius, remaining in the system, but the population level is down to manageable levels, okay? The fourth uh, feasible structure here would have the chemical pesticide. Note how Comperiella calawanica completely succumbs to the chemical insecticide as shown here. There's no population establishment of Comperiella calawanica. And APIS, the, the pollinator, the honeybee, also uh, 
also succumbs, but not completely because there's still some pollination. But uh, uh, some members of the honeybee population in the system would succumb to uh, chemical dosing of neonicotinoid. Okay, note how there's reduced overall health of Aspidiotus rigidus and that of uh, the honeybee, okay? But there's also reduced overall health of the coconut. Now, take note that the infestation level is reduced, but it is still greater than 50%, okay? There is zero reproduction of Comparella calawanica, as I've said, because the natural enemies, the parasitic wasps, succumb to toxicity rendered by the chemical insecticide, okay? So uh, there's consequently reduced yield of consumable nuts. So this one is a chemically controlled system with release of biological control agents, but the biological control agents die from toxicity by the chemical insecticide. Okay, and then the fifth feasible structure generated, okay, we have here no pesticide. There's just uh, the honeybee, there's uh, uh, the pest, okay? So there's reduced overall health of the pest, okay? Aspidiotus rigidus, there's apis, okay, uh, the honeybee, okay? There's also reduced over health of coconut. There's no control measure applied. But there's reduction in infestation level. Okay, not 100%, but still it's greater than 50%. So there's still reduced yield of consumable nuts. So this one is a scenario of uncontrolled infestation. Now, one might ask, what then would affect the, the, the health of Aspidiotus rigidus? If there's no chemical control, there's no biological control. It's supposed to be an uncontrolled infestation. Right, so take note that there are uh, there the Aspidiotus rigidus needs to properly establish, okay, on uh, the host plant, okay, and there are other factors that may come into play. Now, this one is a is a scenario that was uh, generated by the model, but what what one one thing interesting here is that the uncontrolled infestation scenario is not very different from the chemically controlled system. Right? Note how for the chemical, chemically controlled system, there's 62% uh, yield or production of nuts, 62% infestation. And the uncontrolled scenario, it's similar 62% yield of coconuts and 62% level of infestation. So, what would that imply then? Okay? So, is pesticide, is chemical insecticide really necessary? Okay, so now uh, the sixth feasible structure, sorry about that, shows a completely healthy coconut agro ecosystem. There's no pest, there's no need for chemical insecticide application, there's no need for release of biological control agent or Comparella calawanica. There's maximum overall health of the pollinators as well as that of the coconut and there's maximum yield of consumable nuts. So this one is the ideal scenario. No pest. There's no need for control application, right? So now let's summarize the findings. The feasible network structures that would have Comperiella calawanica showed maximal, maximal, rather, maximal consumable nut production. Okay? What would be the implication? That biological control using Comperiella calawanica effectively manages the Aspidiotus rigidus infestation and leads to recovery of productivity by the affected tree. Okay? And then, those with considerable input of the chemical insecticide, dinotefiran, those structures, network structures, showed significantly reduced consumable nut production, as you have noticed earlier. So what would that imply? It could imply that there is collateral harm rendered by the non-target effects of dinotefiran. First, on the pollinator. If pollinators succumb to toxicity by uh, the insecticide, there would be less pollination service. There would be less consumable nuts produced, right? Okay. Non-target effects of the insecticide would also be rendered on the biological control agent, thereby 
lowering the biological control potential of whatever population of Comperiella calawanica that is present in the system. Okay? Another finding... And that was what happened this time in uh, the case of Zamboanga City. In Zamboanga City, there were, were uh, Professor Amalin and I, we went there uh, initially to train people on biological control of Cocolisap, which eventually turned into a field research and pilot testing of the biological control technology that we were able to develop in Luzon using Comperiella Calawanica. So in areas where there was no chemical control employed or applied on the infested, heavily infested coconut trees, there was just release and spread of Comperiella Calawanica. Okay? Uh, by the way, the Comperiella Calawanica was brought from Luzon. Okay? Professor Amalin and I brought Comperiella Calawanica from Luzon to Mindanao, to Zamboanga. And we released because uh, when we confirmed the occurrence of Aspidiotus rigidus in Zamboanga City, there was no Comperiella yet. Hence, we released Comperiella in uh, Zamboanga City. Okay? There was no chemical control applied in this particular spot shown in the photo with the heavily infested coconut palms. Okay? It's just Comperiella Calawanica. And there was also no typhoon that struck Zamboanga City during that time. Okay? And in less than a year, the coconut trees were able to recover. Okay? As can be seen by the completely healthy fronds as well as the production of nuts by what used to be heavily infested coconut trees. So from uh, the real world or the real yes, the real world case in Zamboanga City. And what we were able to find, so among the findings rather of our network analysis using PGRAPH, okay, they're consistent with each other, right? So in the context of integrated pest management, if we were to apply socio-ecological network modeling, okay, what information can we use? First, we will be able to identify what control strategy can be effective, okay? For a given scenario, okay, and also uh, it it this one is not 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 shown in uh, the coconut agro ecosystem network model, okay. But actually, you can also use PGRAPH models to uh, to determine the possible timing of control application, so that the control application uh, the control that will be used, the control strategy that will be used. Uh, will be as effective as possible. And using PGRAPH modeling, we can also identify potential consequences of the control strategy or control strategies that we will introduce to the system. Okay? And through PGRAPH or socio-ecological network modeling uh, using the PGRAPH approach, we can also uh, uh, identify okay? how the agroecosystem may be further modified or manipulated. Okay? So just a sneak peek, ano, uh, this one, uh, we are coming up with uh, network modeling of uh, the potato agroecosystem. So this is something that our group is cooking up right now. Okay? Uh, the pests that we are uh, going to describe okay, in this model is a pest that is not yet here in the Philippines. But there is uh, a likelihood that that pest species, it's an important pest of potato, it can invade the Philippines, especially given climate change. Okay? So, uh, from what we have been doing, okay, not just on uh, modeling, network modeling of the coconut agro ecosystem, but uh, that was a very instrumental uh, study that showed 
how the p-graph approach can be a viable theoretical approach in modeling and analyzing ecological networks for pest management. What we did was actually the first uh, application of the p-graph approach for pest management. Okay? And ecological network models, okay, as what we have shown, uh, can actually aid us in coming up with informed decisions. Are we going to use biological control? Are we going to use chemical control? What would happen if I use chemical control? What would happen if I use biological control? Would chemical control and biological control be compatible if they were uh, applied together okay, or side by side eh, for integrated pest management? Okay, So those uh, very important decisions can be aided by ecological network modeling okay so i would like to acknowledge at this point uh professor divina amalin professor kathleen aviso doctor uh, professor roberto cabezas professor angeline lau and uh, professor raymond tan uh for this uh endeavor thank you very much po, for your kind attention uh if there are questions, uh, we, we, we would like to you know, discuss uh, what you may have in mind, especially in view of what I shared to everyone. Thank you very much, Po, and God bless us all. Solideo Gloria. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Billy and my witness, for that very interesting lecture. Uh, but before we proceed with the QA portion, um, yeah, I just want to remind everyone, uh, if you have any questions, you can just type in in our chat box or uh, perhaps unmute yourself uh, to ask a question. Uh, and uh, before I turn over the floor to my co-host, uh, Ms. Ria Sumaga, I would just like to acknowledge the presence of Brother Joe Schreiber. Good evening, brother. So uh, the floor is yours, Ms. Ria. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Billy, for that very wonderful and relevant presentation. It's really interesting because there is a real world application. And we have seen that um, we have that there's confirmation of the your results in Zambanga. So are there any questions from the audience? You may type in your questions in the chat box or you may unmute yourself. So if there's none, I will ask the first question. So my question is, are you planning to add more parameters to refine the model? And if yes, what parameters do you plan to add? Uh, thank you, Ms. Ria, for that question. By the way, is it okay if I turn my webcam off? It, it's My webcam is having some issues. Anyway, I, I think uh can still hear my voice. All right. Uh, are there other parameters that we would like that for the coconut agro ecosystem uh yes we can i know we're, we're actually first thought of i know uh we first thought of adding the natural enemy of the natural enemy okay uh <laughs> it, it, it's it, it's what we call the hyper parasitoid okay it's a, it's a parasitoid of the parasitoid so parang ano uh, the enemy of the natural enemy so the question is, would the enemy of the natural enemy be friend to the pest? So that's what uh, can, what could have been shown. Uh, we could also add another uh, another mortality factor that was into, but it was it was used more in in the Zamboanga infestation, not in southern Tagalog. That's why we limited the the first uh, coconut agro ecosystem model to what. Uh, what were uh, involved in the pest management scenario. Okay, We also wanted to add actually another species of uh, coconut scale insect, the one that I mentioned in the presentation that's closely related to what caused the outbreak in southern Tagalog and later on in Zamboanga Peninsula, as well as the natural enemies that were released as an attempt for uh, attempt at biological control but uh, we wanted to uh, make our case study as simple as uh, possible uh, during that time hence uh, we did not yet include but 
yes in in the few in, in in the future we can add those and we can uh i i'm sure that we will be able to see uh what the interactions possible interactions between and among some of those additional components with what currently exists in the model would be and how they could affect uh, coconut productivity. Thank you very much for that interesting um, answer, Dr. Billy. So it's exciting that there are so many possibilities that we can check using PGRAPH uh, without actually doing the experiments because as we know, experiments can be expensive and time consuming and they we do not know the adverse effects in the environment. So it's very good that we have PGRAPH to first model and the check the, the effects of the parameters that we are testing. So anyone from the audience with a question for Dr. Billy? So we have seen that um, the best solution is predominantly the biologically driven. Are there any additional measures that we can take to ensure the success of the biological um, of the species in reducing the coccolisa infestation? For example, do we need to reproduce and release additional bees? Uh, just an example. So are there any steps that we should take to ensure the, the success of the biological driven solution? Uh... Augmentation is always possible if the biological control agent is all, all, all is already in the system, okay. But uh, as for other facts, so in biological control, there's uh, there's like uh, inoculative releases, there's augmentation, and then uh, there's also and very important that we have to uh, consider and we have to maintain is conservation. So there are there are mortality factors that were not included in the network in the model that apart from the chemical insecticide may also affect the population of the natural enemy. The natural enemy has, be, has to be there in order for it to manage the population of the pest. Right? So uh what we can do is first and foremost let's not rely too much on chemical control. Okay? Uh, there, there, there's this one uh, piece of the puzzle that uh, Professor Amalin and our team have yet to uh, uh, uncover. Like if as if Comperiela Calawanica was already here in the Philippines, how come there was an infestation and eventually an outbreak mm -hmm. of uh, the pest, right? Uh, because one would think that since the 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 natural enemy is native, then it should have averted the outbreak but what happened right if it was here already what happened right uh one uh, well one thing that comes into my mind is that there could have been some mortality factors maybe before Comperella Calawanica was able to manage the population of uh Aspidotus rigidus hence there were no outbreaks but maybe there were mortality factors that uh got into the system uh sometime uh, in the vicinity of 2010, 2009 and 2010, that maybe affected uh, the survival and the uh, control capacity of bio of of Comperiella calawanica. So we don't know. Maybe it could be related to climate change or some other anthropogenic factors. Yes, I hope that you will be able to uncover the answer to that puzzle and um, benefit the. Uh, agriculture industry. So uh, we have. Ms. Ria, is it okay if I answer a question in the chat yes. box? Yes, please. It's a question here from Sir Arthur. Is PGRAPH Studio available for free? Yes, it's available for free. So is it downloadable via their website? And are there tutorials on how to use PGRAPH? Yes, there, 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 there's, uh, there, there's, there's a link. Uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, maybe, wait, let me, let me show again the, uh, 
which is in there you go okay you can go to this website egraph.org and there's a link there for uh download of pgraph studio okay uh i beg your pardon i wasn't able to come up with a qr code for those who would like to download uh right away the uh, application Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Billy, for the interest of time. Let's entertain just one more question, maybe from the audience, if there are any. Okay, if there's none, any parting words, uh, Dr. Billy, uh, any um, conclusions or anything that the audience, any takeaway from uh, your research and uh, from your presentation okay uh as i have mentioned earlier okay uh in the philippines it's a sad reality that we are very reliant on on chemical control and it's hard that for us to shift away from that for there to be a paradigm shift we have to do a lot and research okay and we have a very big role in that Okay, research has to be done in order for us to have a basis, not just for making sound decisions in pest management, but in any other endeavor. Okay, and we have to make sure as, as scientists, as engineers, as researchers, I hope we can, we can, we can as much as possible communicate the findings of our studies other people can use as a basis for decision making in such a way that they will be at least able to appreciate they might they may not be able to understand it completely but at least appreciate what at least the implications uh, would be of those findings another thing that i would like to leave our dear participants with okay is that uh we have to uh, we have to know we have to we have to be courageous enough to step out of our comfort zone to be honest as an entomologist uh, i found it hard to imagine doing something that is being done by engineers okay that's why i i i have admitted that i suppose more of you would be better versed at using the p graph than myself Okay, but uh, I became interested when this was presented uh, way uh, years ago. I was there in a presentation done by Professor Tan. And I thought this is something that so as researchers, scientists, engineers, okay, uh, we have to uh, think out of the box. We have to uh, step out of our comfort zones because that way we will be able to help our society, not just come up with publications and. That, that would of course that those are important but i i suppose it's more important i believe it's more important that the results of our the fruits of our labor as scientists and researchers will be able to benefit uh the greater part of society thank you so much dr billy and congratulations um i would like to turn over the host to uh, dr ice Thank you, Ms. Ria, and thank you for those inspiring words, uh, Dr. Billy, uh, and an excellent, excellent job in your presentation. So let's give a, a round of applause for Dr. Billy Almarina. So thank you so much for uh, your sharing your expertise in today's uh, lecture series. Um, that's all that we have for today, but before we part ways, uh, may we invite you uh, to the next uh, um, lecture uh, series, uh, which is scheduled um, next month, May 31, 2023, same time. Uh, this is entitled Turning the Tide to Save Palawan's Reefs from Threatened to Thriving. And this would be delivered by Dr. Katrina Luzon of De La Salle University. Uh, you may want to register ahead of time uh, for this lecture series. And uh, 
Yeah. Lastly, uh, before we end this session, uh, may we request uh, you to give us some feedback to further improve the delivery of this uh, sustainability lecture series. Uh, your feedback definitely would uh, uh, be a great help in improving the delivery of this lecture series. So again, thank you so much. Again, I am Dr. Ari Sobando and Ms. Ria Sumaga. Uh, we are signing off for today and see you next month for the next lecture. Bye everyone. Thank you Bye, so much. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank see you very you much for thank, thank you, Dr. For Billy. Time. Thank you, Dr. Billy. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Ria. Thank you, Dr. Aris. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.